Today's guest is Ethan Brooks. He's an analyst at Trends and Hustle Media. Ethan, thank you, thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, it's my pleasure, man. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm I'm looking forward to this. You're a trends analyst. You do a bunch of things. Um, I, I'm always wondering. You know, you constantly have to come up with ideas. You got to put your your name on a trend. And I was recently looking at some of the the predictions I made, and uh, you know, hanging my head in shame. How do you do it? Oh no. <laughs> Well, I'll, uh, before I answer, uh, what 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 are some of the predictions that you made? Like, what what have you well, been reviewing recently? Some of the some of the I mean, went back to a two thousand and nine interview, and I you know they cornered me on which companies was going to win sort of the streaming game for a uh, sort of streaming for video on mobile, and I named a company went broke a year after. But I was oh. the, the easy thing is that eventually the cost of broadband and technology was going to come, but people are going to be streaming on their phone. That's 2009. Whenever you write a book, you know, you mm. name the great companies that are following your trajectory. And as you know, with any book, like Good to Great is an, a great example. Every couple of years, they, they, they cut out half the companies that didn't pan out. They, they add a new set of companies that supports the thesis. And I think for us, when we wrote our book, you know, we had a couple of companies that won and a couple of companies like Kodak, we were hot on because we had some inside access that, that blew up. So um, that, that's where I'm coming from. Yeah, man, it's tough. I think, okay, so how do you make a prediction? I think there's actually a couple of things about this uh, I would love to unpack. The first is that actually... I don't think we make that many predictions. So I, I actually kind of get to cheat on this a little bit. Um, what we do over at Trends, for anybody who doesn't know, is like, you know, it's a weekly newsletter where we're basically highlighting uh, emerging business opportunities and showing people how to capitalize on them. And uh, one of the real benefits of that is that like, everything we try to do is data backed. So I, and, and we will have conversations about this uh, behind the scenes as we're drafting something. Because sometimes you, you're excited about a trend and you say like, hey, there's going to be opportunities to grow this or this is going to be huge. And we'll kind of catch each other in the editing process and say, well, actually, we, we don't know if it's going to be big for, ex- for the same reasons that you just said. The only thing we can say is that it is big now. And like, here's how you could capitalize. So most of the year, we actually try to stay away from um, any what we call crystal ball gazing. Like, predicting what's going to be big and instead focus on data from the very recent past that suggests something is, is going to be continue to be like successful. That said, we do uh, twice a year put on those like magicians hats and we'll, we'll write what we call our predictions issues where we get the, and it's kind of like a competition. We'll get the whole team together and we ask everybody, Hey, you know, one to 200 words, what do you think is going to be like the next major trend? And that's the opportunity for writers to cut loose and just kind of say like, hey, here's this thing. Everybody thinks it's crazy, but I think it's going to be big. And I would say I don't uh, I haven't gone back and checked, but my hit rate on those is probably no better than a coin toss. So like, (laughs) yeah, like, well, well, uh, my last one was um, privacy. Like I felt like privacy was going to be big. And I think that's played out. This year's is maybe a little bit more controversial. It's magazines. I think this is going to be the year that magazine publishing becomes big again. But um, both of those are a little bit more, uh, they're, they're a little more based on, um, you know, your gut feeling as you spend weeks just kind of trawling through the trenches, the articles, uh, social conversation, stuff like that. They're not as data backed as most of the research that we put out there. So yeah, the research is easier to put my name on because uh, I'm just looking backwards, not forwards, even though it kind of feels like you're looking forwards. That's kind of the, the cheat answer to it. But I have another, um, I'll pause for a second, but I have another thought on how to find them if people uh, are interested. Yes. Okay, so um, this is probably the harder part of what we do, which is like, Again, we're not really predicting things, but we do have this audience that's looking for business opportunities every week. And, I'll, and you, you know, because you're a community leader in Trends, one of the like major connectors inside of our network. Um, there's real operators in there, right? Like p- 
people building real businesses. So I can't just come out and say like, Hey, here's fidget spinners. You should go sell fidget spinners because people might listen to that like once or twice, but after a while, they're going to say, this is, these are tchotchkes. I, I want a real business, you know? Um, so the challenge for us has always been, how do we continue to find high quality opportunities week after week? And we've gone, I think each analyst kind of has their own little tips and tricks for doing this. But one that I've found particularly helpful is I will keep an eye out for companies that I find that are just interesting, right? Um and every business owner listening to this, you know, somebody, you know, some company that you think is really cool. And you're like, oh, that's a neat idea. And then I actually have a template that I use for deconstructing the company and building out a case study on them. Oh. Um, and in the process of doing that deep dive, you will almost inevitably find these emerging opportunities that you never would have suspected. Um, oh. So rather than like looking for data or looking for trends or something like that, I start with what are you interested in? Yeah. And then do a super deep dive on that. Read interviews with the founders or uh, if, you know, if it's a publicly traded company, you can read their investor filings. Um, there's a whole bunch of tools that you can use to like deconstruct a business, figure out where they get their traffic from, all kinds of things. And in that process, you inevitably surface these little like curiosities where you're like, Oh, I didn't realize this was such a big industry or that was such a big opportunity. So it starts from curiosity and then continues from there. Yeah. Give me an example. It sounds fascinating. Okay. So let me think about this. I'm just going to pull it up real quick on my computer. So I keep everything in notion and I literally built out, I have a, um, uh, a template for what a typical do you want me to share my screen do you ever do that um, like on the video no, no but i would love to we might, might need to describe it though let's see um let's see if I yeah can. go ahead i think you can share okay cool yeah so i have this template and it, there's basically a few sections to it whenever i'm trying to deconstruct a company i'm looking at a few things like in general kind of what are the nuts and bolts of the business and how it runs I, I'm particularly interested in version 0.0. .0 so how do they get something off the ground? Like how do you get your first customer, literally customer, num customer number one? What does the very first day of the website look like? How do you get your early funding? Stuff like that. How do they make their money? So monetization, growth and marketing. How are they bringing in new customers? And then I always look at things like, you know, their operations. So what are they hiring for? Because that's a pretty interesting indicator for where their priorities are. Um, and, and some other things I'll, I'll go into this critique section in, in a minute, wow. but so these are, these are where I start. And for everybody listening, this basically under each of those categories, there's a series of concrete actions that I'll do for every single company that I break down. And the reason I have these listed is because it, like, it just makes the whole deconstruction process a lot easier because rather than basically running down a rabbit hole with every single company that I think is cool. I can kind of come here and go bang, 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 bang. And I know I'm going to get a relatively high quality breakdown. So for example, in this general section, first thing I do is I always go to crunch base and I look up a company and I see if they're listed there. And if they are listed there, I'll look to see if there's any news because crunch base does a really good job of curating news from around the web. Hmm. So if they do, I'll read everything that's there. Then I type the founder's name into Google and read all resulting interviews. This has gotten a little harder because People don't publish interviews anymore. It's all podcasts. So oh, if you're yeah. gonna like, if you're gonna research somebody, you gotta like listen to hours of uh, of podcasts. Then I look at the founder's social media and their blog, and then I'll I will specifically look to see if the company's main goal is published somewhere. So those are some examples of like things that I'll generally do at the very beginning to get an idea of how the company was started and what they're trying to do. Now inside of that. Um, you will inevitably find somebody like a, you know, if I'm looking at a company like Peak Designs. So this was an, an example. Um, Peak Designs, if anybody's never heard of it, is sort of a camera, what are they? They're like a travel and lifestyle brand now, but they started as a camera accessory brand. And I just thought it was really interesting because they're like, you know, they've got this really great philosophy. They seem to care about their employees. They uh, give a certain percentage of their money back to 
you know, help offset carbon emissions. And um, they've done a lot of community-based fundraising on Kickstarter. In fact, all their funding, they've written, they, they actually hold the record for most money raised on Kickstarter by any company in the history of the platform. So um, they were just interesting to me and I started to break them down. And in the course of that breakdown, you see things like, um, I'm scrolling through for people who are listening here, but like, I have all this data here on how much they raised for each of their uh, rounds. So they've done more than, I think more than a dozen or like 10 Kickstarter campaigns at this point. And several of them have raised, you know, four, five, six million dollars a pop. And inside of that data, you get to see, oh, well, that's interesting that such and such raised this much money. I didn't know there was so much demand for that. And then as you, you can kind of continue to pull back the layers and that's where these opportunities come from. So for me, I always start from this point of like, oh, there's a cool company. I would love to know more about how they run. Then I start going through this checklist. And as you do that, you start to find opportunities that you're like, oh, I didn't realize there was such a huge, uh, like huge potential in this particular space. That, that makes sense. You start with the company, it inspires creativity. Maybe the company itself is unique. Maybe the industry is unique. Maybe it spawns off um, uh, other ideas to head down other rabbit holes with, with things you find. You just go deeper and deeper and it just sort of pulls you out of um, any tendency to kind of wander off uh, on a predetermined path. You just keep going down the rabbit hole. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll find all kinds of stuff. And like, this is great for business owners to do too, even if you've already got a business, because you're going to find things like operational things that can really help. So as one example, you know, I'm still looking at this peak design case study. Um, so they've done several different Kickstarter campaigns, but one that's particularly interesting is this one that happened in 2015. So up until 2015, they'd run, you know, I think four or five campaigns each one had done anywhere from like a half a million to almost a million dollars. And then all of a sudden they come out of the gate in 2015 with a new product that raises almost $5 million. So like five X, whatever they had previously raised. Um, and, you know, I think any natural business owner would look at that and go, huh, like, I wonder what happened there. And it turns out if you dig one layer deeper and start deconstructing that campaign, the major thing that set that apart was that that was the first time they ever partnered with an influencer. This is back in 2015, oh. before influencers were big. They brought on, uh, I think it was Cameron Haynes. If I'm getting that name right. There's a very well-known photographer that they brought on. And this person basically helped them spread the word to their audience. And it was, you know, it was, it was huge. It provided a ton of PR. Um, and so you, you know, you look at that and you're like, oh, well, that's interesting as a business owner. Maybe like, maybe I can learn from that. And I mean, I can go on and on, but we, we ended up writing like a whole piece about this in trends and like what you can learn from kind of deconstructing a company like this. So there's, I think there's a lot of value for anybody who is looking for business ideas to spend, you know, spend some of your spare time just deconstructing businesses that you think are interesting. And if you already have a business, it like, you know, I know anybody who's already got a business doesn't have a ton of spare time. Right. But, uh, you know, if you do have, like, if you do have some, the return that you get from specifically deconstructing a business that you think is interesting, is like an asymmetric return. There's a huge return on that time spent. So that's what I do. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I've never seen one, uh, th that idea before. So I, I love that um, system you have. Uh, starting with a, an entity is, is a great thing. I mean, when I'm interviewing people, I always find um, that I believe that everyone has an inter interesting story. You know, some people may not share their entire story because there's protected elements of their story. And I get that. Mm -hmm. But when, if, if we're perfectly honest, everyone has twists and turns that are unique. So I'm taking that analogy and saying, hey, every company, you know, if you can get to the root of what happened, there's deep, deep learning that can happen from any company. And I think that's, that's what you're, you're optimizing against. Totally. Yeah. And this is good for anybody who is, like wants to get into 
content creation as well, because that same thing that you just pointed out goes for literally every product on the planet. There is nothing that exists, at least nothing, you know, human made that doesn't have some kind of like interesting story behind its creation. And at least one person somewhere who's the expert in why that thing is the way it is. And so if you're looking for interesting stories, uh, it's helpful to kind of get into this habit of asking yourself like, hmm, I wonder why this is the way it is. And, and that could be anything, you know, like one of my favorite examples is there's a, there's a writer named Bill Bryson, who is one of my, he's one of my favorites. And he wrote a book called At Home, which is sort of about the history of the world and how all these major um, like world events basically end up finding their way into our house. So he started from this uh, question of, you know, like, like, why do we have salt and pepper on the table? Why are those two? You know, there's so many spices. Why, why is it those two? And it turns out there's a story there. Or, um, for, you know, I know for like construction, why are stairs the way they are? And it turns out there's a whole history. I and mean, maybe people in the trades know this better than most, but like there's a whole history behind the design of stairs. And there's like one guy who's written the book on why stairs are the way they are. And like, he's actually gone through and done the research to figure out, you know, like how changing the height or the, the depth of the tread changes the risk factor of the stairs. So there's experts out there on everything. You just have to get curious about it. And um, being on the team that I've been on has been like a real gift because it kind of surrounds me with curious people. Yeah. I mean, what's, what's the right uh, balance for an operator of being curious and, you know, running, running the business, right? Uh, like what's the, what do you feel is the right balance? That's a good question. You know, I don't, I don't know, but I do feel like some of the most effective operators that I know are relentlessly curious. So like this whole practice of breaking down companies, like I do this in my spare time. This is when I want to wind down. This is kind of like, I don't, this is what I do instead of Netflix. Sometimes I just, I actually just burned through the entire, what is it? Fourth season of Ozark too. So there you go. I also do the Netflix thing, but um I kind of picked this up from some people here at the hustle. Like Sam used to do the same thing. You just, this is how he likes to spend his time is breaking down companies. And so, and you know, for anybody who doesn't know, Sam Parr founded the hustle and recently sold it for, you know, $20 million. So, or 20 plus, I don't know the actual number, but um, the point there is there are a lot of people who are extremely effective operators. And I, it feels to me, this is just um, kind of an instinct, like they don't even schedule time to be curious. It is what fills any spare moment of their time. They just, they can't help but be curious. And I think that, I think that can actually be developed as well. Mm -hmm. I do think that, that that trait can be developed. I feel like um, uh, just the other part, just what you were talking about to add to it, I feel like they have a strong sense of purpose that links to the curiosity. So there's some direct uh, directional um, sort of filtering mechanisms on what moves forward, but I feel like they really know what makes them tick. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And then also there's like um, kind of a humility to it too, which is like a willingness to reach out and just ask people, hey, how did you do this? Uh, which I think, you know, you asked a good question, like how much of your time should be spent operating versus being curious. And it almost seems like, you know, up to a certain point, if you invest time in being curious, you're going to save time on the operational side, because you'll learn things, you won't have to like do so much through um, trial and error. Yeah, I don't, I don't have, it's like, I don't have time to be proactive. <laughs> I haven't heard that, but I like it. Yeah, I have, don't have time to be proactive. I love that. <laughs> I uh, I actually started off as a like a, a web developer, and um, you know, one of the kind of trade phrases people throw around there is is just like you know, no matter what, don't do anything, right? <laughs> like because you're gonna you're gonna cause a lot more of your own problems by through frantic action than than you will if you just kind of 
pause and wait, but I love that. I don't have time to be proactive. <laughs> So um, what strikes me about the team at Hustle, very dynamic, smart, can identify trends, not afraid of failure. I mean, essentially, I get the sense that anyone on the team could start a company and be successful. You know, how does that culture work? And, and, and you know, that there's some continuity with the team. So how, how does that all come together? Mm. Yeah, um, that's a good question. I think well, we were talking about this a little bit before the before we pressed record. It, it, there is kind of this interesting dynamic at play, at least on the editorial side, where it, it f- at least for this publication, it's a little difficult to hire for because you do kind of have to find somebody who knows enough about business to be dangerous and is good enough at spotting business opportunities to like to write about that, um, but doesn't want to run a business. Uh, so. I do think we've kind of ended up building this culture of people who are very entrepreneurially minded. Um, And some do go off and run their own thing. You know, like Alex Garcia used to run our social media platform and he killed it, man. Like he, he, there are some people who just know what they're doing. Um, One thing he did as like a side experiment for himself, he grew his personal Twitter following from 5,000 to 28,000 in less than 30 days. Uh, and he did that by sharing one high quality thread about marketing every single day for, I think it was 28 days. Um, so you have people who are like real operators, they know what they're doing and they can do this stuff, but for whatever reason, they choose to come kind of be part of this team for a while And, uh, you know, that, I think, I don't remember if he was here pre-acquisition or post-acquisition, but the, the reality is, I think that's a risk that every business owner takes. It's like, if you want people who are entrepreneurially minded, you're going to have to live with the risk that they might leave at some point, right. And go do their own thing. And the question is, is that worth it to you? And I don't, I don't know what the answer is. I think it probably changes for each person. But at least in our experience, or in my experience, um, it is, right? It's worth it to risk uh, not being able to hold on to somebody in order to have that experience of like just kind of the amazing things that can happen when you put the right group of people in, in a room together. Um, and in some sense, I don't know, I would be curious to hear how you feel about this because, you know, I'm in media and like that's a very different game from what some people are listening or some of the listeners here are trying to build Um, on our team. It's like, it's like our job to go kind of be popular. And once you have a following of some kind, like you could go off and you could start a business. Uh, And what I was, I was thinking recently, I'm like, you know, if it works right, it almost can't last forever. Right. Because at some point, um, your like your audience is either growing or it's failing, right? So if the people on your team are growing, like let's say you bring in, <clears throat> I don't know, a social media manager to come in and manage the account for your business. If they really are good at it, maybe you've got some people who are writing blog articles and you're trying to position your company as a thought leader in whatever your space is. If you really do that right, it can't last forever because those people should build a reputation that's so big it transcends your company. And I think what a lot of businesses are trying to figure out is how to, how, how do you do that in a way that's like both beneficial to the brand and graceful and beneficial to the people who are building it? Yeah. I don't know that there's a lot of answers to that. I mean, the only solution I could think of is the company itself has to commit to growing at the same pace as the people in the organization. So you're always trying through resources to be one step so that it, it, there is always a progression in the learning. And the second thing is there occasionally people are gonna be on such high trajectory. What you do from what I can see is you celebrate them like crazy on the way out the door and um, you, you keep helping them and, and that partnership continues and it attracts more people that are earlier in the, their face. So that's the only thing I can see working. Yeah, I think that's wise. It's almost like um, companies now that are experimenting with this content or 
uh, influencer strategy. You're almost like a VC in some ways where it's like, you know, you're in, you're investing in people with the hope that they get bigger and that their success is going to lead to your success. And this is sort of the little known second stage to VC is like, you want to develop a reputation for being so pro founder that they bring you the next major deal in your portfolio. And I think, I, I think you're right. I think that's, that's kind of the way to do it. Yeah. Um, but we're still so early. I mean, most companies are just starting to experiment with this idea of, you know, cr- like bringing creators in house and really fostering their careers. And, you know, it's a, it's, it's a privilege for anybody who, wanted to be in that creative space like for me I always wanted to be a writer but I started my career in a technical field because it was kind of the only way I could figure out how to make money and it's easy to forget that even like five years ago you couldn't really make a living as a creator now it's not the same like there's companies that are willing to invest in you but it's on everybody to kind of make sure that this model works for everyone involved otherwise companies are just going to stop doing it too you know yeah so, so uh, a lot of um, uh, projects or, or, or trends I see on trends, you know, one of the ways the, the strategies that are emerging in the market is about, you know, building the audience before the product and, and all that thing. And I, I, I talked to a friend of mine that kind of coined this term digital charisma. And um, I like that. But some people have it and some people don't in the temperament. And the, the question is, Let's say you don't have it. Maybe you have the ability to improve it, but let's say you're, you're on the wrong side of digital char- uh, 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 charisma and you didn't win the TikTok lottery. What do you do? That's a great question. And okay, I have a couple of thoughts about this. I'll start with a, like a kind of a fundamental, this is a, a, like a line from Stephen King. So Stephen King believes that you can take a bad writer and you can make them good. And you can take a good writer and you can make them great, but you can't make a bad writer into a great writer. And what he's getting at there is that there's like some fundamental, not not born ability, but it's like some people develop this wiring very early on and like they see the world through words and that is how they approach the world. And you can take somebody who doesn't have that and you can make them pretty good, Um, but it's very unlikely that you're going to make them into a fantastic, uh, like a creator of prose or something. And I think that's okay. So I think the same thing probably goes for these different social media or like, like charisma arenas, right? So if we're talking like TikTok, Twitter, YouTube, I think each one has its own kind of personality. Mm. And if you happen to jive well with one of those and you find it, you're going to do incredibly well, right? Because you'll outpace everybody who's, who's just trying to gr- kind of grit their way through building whatever it is, a Twitter audience. If you like Trung, Trung is an amazing example of this. He, uh, for anybody who doesn't know him, Trung fan, T-R-U-N-G, uh, P-H-A-N. He's on my team. He is a Twitter phenom, Right. The guy posts at all hours of the day. He's hilarious. He's great at Twitter. He's got that. He's got that charisma you're mentioning. Yeah, like it's I, just I saw naturally... him, uh, Elon responding to one of his tweets. So yeah, yeah. Like Elon's responded to a, a couple of them at this point. And like you know, famous comedian. Uh, Has I think his name is Hassan Minhaj. He was on uh, the My First Million podcast. He knows about Trung from Twitter. So it's like the guy's got reach now, and. He puts in a tremendous amount of work, but he also has that, like he's got a personality that is naturally tuned to that particular frequency, right? So it's working for him. Now, what do you do if you don't have that? Well, I would suggest probably two things. The first is to look around a little bit, try some different things and see if there is one that you like are naturally attuned to because each one's got its its own feel. Like I'm all right at Twitter. I'm, I am all right. Not that great. I love doing podcasts. Like I could, I, and I don't know, like, I won't go so far as to say I'm like the Trung fan of podcasting, but I love this format. Right. And that makes it easy. So it makes, if nothing else, it makes it easy for me to keep showing up and, and getting better. So, so play around a little bit, find, see if there's a format that you really enjoy, because the reality is you don't have to be on any of them. Some, I think it's popular, especially in, um, 
like less digital businesses. Like when I was building websites, I used to build websites for bed and breakfasts and like electrical contractors and stuff like that. And so I know that there's, there's actually a culture out there that's going to some of these trades and saying like, well, you have to be on TikTok and you have to be on Twitter and you have to be on YouTube. And it sounds true, but it's not. You don't have to be anywhere. What you have to do is figure out what really resonates with you and do that. So the first thing I'd suggest is like play around a little bit and see if there's one that that really does work. Um, and uh, I forget what the second thing was. It'll come back to me in a second. But <laughs> but yeah, that big idea is like if 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 you don't feel like you have this charisma out of the gate, it might be that you're just on like trying to compete on the wrong platform. And I would stay away from that. Like. I don't know. How do you feel about this? I, to me, I feel like like TikTok always rubbed me the wrong way. As, yeah. Early on when it was just people like dancing and smiling, I was like, this seems weird, man. I could never be a TikTok guy. Yeah. Now I think the culture there is changing. And yeah. it feels like it's... I think there's a few things I've run across over the years. I, like you said, what's the natural tendency of the entrepreneur or the, the, or the, the company, right? So, you know, as a leader, you know, tr like you said, try different formats, Maybe there's a way there's a, there's alignment between your customer base and your personal interest or your talent, right? So talent is the best. And then if you're interested in getting better, that's great. Um, it, could, it could be you're interested in getting better, which is always good, which you'll, you'll get to good, maybe great just on interest. But, but I, I ran across something um, by one of my guests. It's, they said, there's three types of weaknesses. I'm like, what, what's that? Right? And he says, well, there's weaknesses like yeah, that don't matter, right? You know, like for me, I'm not good at cooking. And in my situation, that doesn't matter. Um, and then there's, you know, things that uh, weaknesses that you have to mitigate. Um, so let's say in business, if you're an operator, you kind of have to be average in all three areas, demand gen, operations, which is keeping the customer happy, and finances, doing it properly. You at least need to be good in one minimum. If you're great in all three, that's great. But the well, one good two average is probably going to get you pretty far. Um, so you have to mitigate. And then if you want to take over the world, depending on your goals, and, and you have to speak in front of billions of people that, you know, there's certain weaknesses that you have to turn into a strength and you have to will your way to do it if you want to do it and, and find that, 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 you know, energy, like, you know, the, the lifting of the car, right? When, when someone is trapped underneath to do it, but it really has to mean to you. So I think it's kind of a combination of like looking at that and to determining what your vision is and then kind of finding a way and even if it's not you who is the you know how do you get closer to people that can do this right i think back in the old days it was like your website is good as the best design the, the best designer that's closest to you and if that's your daughter then that's your website and if your friend is a designer you most likely have a really good website so look through your team and say well do I have a programmer, like who, you know, someone that's close and look at the holes and the, and the diversity will de determine how your base, um, you know, set up is an entrepreneurship. That's a great point. You're making me think too, that as you do that search, you'll probably uncover somebody on your team who may be more valuable in one of these other roles, right? Like if you have a young kid just kind of doing front office stuff after school or whatever, they might be really well attuned to TikTok or Twitter or one of these other platforms. Um, and that, you know, there can be a, a much higher return on it, whatever you're paying them if you kind of pivot them into that role as well, or kind of give them the free range to experiment, which I think ties in with what we were saying earlier about facilitating growth. Um, there's another thing that you are making me think of, which is like authenticity. And I think, um, I don't know which of these would be like stack ranked first, whether it's finding the platform that's right for you or just being authentic on any platform. But there is a space for like being yourself, even if yourself, it doesn't really jive with how the platform typically works. The one that comes to mind for me is Jocko Willink. Does, mm. Do you know Jocko? Uh, I mean, I, I heard you know of his stuff. He's very, you know, he's, he's a very well uh, uh, published author. 
Yeah, he's one of my favorite Instagram accounts because he posts three things. He posts a picture of his watch every morning at 4.30 in the morning, like a picture of his kettlebell after he's done kettlebells. And then every once in a while, there'll be like a little video in there or, uh, you know, a picture from a hunting trip or something like that. But there's no lifestyle influencer stuff. There's no creativity. It is, but it's 100% on brand because Jacko's thing is he wakes up every day and he does the work. Wow. And so it's not some, yeah, it's like, I think he was the first person I saw. And to my knowledge, my, maybe he's still even the only one doing this, um, who <laughs> just used Instagram to post the same picture every single day. And if people go look at it, it's still the same. He's got three, <laughs> three things that he does there. And he's been going for like five years at this point, every day. So there's something to be said for just being yourself on a platform, even if it doesn't, even if you, you're not quite in sync with everybody else if you do it long enough you'll find enough people that agree with you yeah yeah well there's also i mean people love novelty too you know there was this example maybe it was the natural history museum do you remember this i think it was maybe Mm -hmm. one or two years ago some security guard at a museum was basically asked to do the Twitter account for a day or something happened. And I could pull up the story if I, if, if I had a minute, but it was, it, it, to this day, I don't know if they did this on purpose or if this was really just this guy. But when you read the tweets, it was, it gave you the impression that he didn't really know uh, how Twitter worked, right? Like he would, he would, uh, he would, take a picture of a of an exhibit and say hey isn't this a cool exhibit and then he would literally write out the word hashtag museum so h-a-s-h-t-a-g or he'd say you know my, my niece says i need to use hashtags so he'd write the word hashtag in the post and people loved just how uh earnest his posts were like this was a guy who was not trying to take over twitter he was just trying to like, you know, I don't know, do this crazy Twitter thing for work or whatever. And he was just like a really wholesome kind of guy. It went crazy. So there is, there's something to be said for just kind of being yourself and experimenting with things, even if it's not exactly how the platform typically works. I love it. I mean, you're a wealth of information. We could go for hours. Um, is, is there anything, I, I, you know, anything you wanted to bring, bring up that I haven't asked you about? Um, no, nothing that comes to mind for me. I'm curious what, so I've listened to a couple episodes of the podcast so far. What do you think is one thing that people would, would really like to get out of this episode? Like, is there one thing we haven't covered yet that would just be killer well, for everybody listening? One thing that was, that I've already got out of the episode, and I'm hoping um, if you're listening that you'll go and watch the video is, I mean, you just took, you're talking we're talking about Tim Ferriss sharing it all you just took your valuable template that's your that's your secret sauce on doing the deep dives and you just scroll through it like nothing and you know did that's just living living you know that sort of transparency and authenticity so I mean I we have never done a screen share um, on the show which um, I never even clued into doing so to me that's I, I will always uh, remember that and think about how else can I do that? So great, man. I'm glad that was useful. And I'll tell you what, if, if you thought it was cool, uh, what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll whip up a version and I'll send it over to you and you can give it to anybody who's listening to this as well. Sweet. So I'll just I'll put it on the website. Um, absolutely. Thank you, Ethan. That is extremely, uh, extremely generous. My pleasure, man. Thanks for having me on. It was always fun to uh, fun to chat, and I really enjoyed it. So thank you. Thanks to everybody who's listening. Yeah.